Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. Today we're going to do something a little bit different, um, introducing you to the first in a periodic series that I'm calling Insight. So it's going to be a series where there'll be a little bit more meat on the bones in terms of, uh, it won't just be commentary and thoughts uh, on everyday events. I'll look at an issue, take a bit more time to sort of dissect it, and add in a few more points than I otherwise would. And it may not be something that's bubbling away on the boil right now, but if it is, that's just more by pure coincidence and that I've been thinking about this a bit more. You could actually say the first video I actually did on this channel and the third one, which uh, both looked at Joseph Parker and some of the things happening in his career, um, they were sort of more in the vein of what the insight will be. I guess hindsight is 2020 and I could have maybe relabeled them but oh uh, well so we'll start with this one which i'm focusing on luis ortiz his struggles and uh, the pain that is his career and trying to get a title shot a real title shot okay so you're with me let's look at his beginnings luis the real king kong ortiz so he grew up in cuba he was part of the much fabled amateur system there he had a record of 343 wins and 19 losses. Interestingly about those losses, five of them came against his compatriot Odlandia Solis, who won gold at the Athens Olympic and later had a failed title shot against Vitaly Klitschko in 2011. Yes, all the way back then. And fun fact here, Solis is a year younger than Ortiz. So just consider that. So Ortiz at the moment is 38 and Solis who's off the scene now is uh, 37. So, okay, back to his age, which um, I'll come back to again later in the video. Supposedly, he's 38. Officially, he was born in March 1979. You never know with some of these uh, Cuban fighters and their official records. Uh, there has been some instances in the past where uh, paperwork has either been lost, forged, or something has happened along the way. And I guess in terms of Ortiz, he does look about 40-something, um, so um, the internet does love to joke about his age. So the six foot four fighter, he has an incredible 84 inch reach, turned pro in 2010 at the age of 30. A slightly advanced age in turning pro, but he was in the Cuban system, which is, you know, amateur fighting is what is the done thing. Since then, um, the, the real King Kong has fashioned a record of 27-0. He's actually had 29 fights, but the two were ruled no contest. One that you might remember was against Latif Kiyoti, and that was in 2014. After that fight, where he won the WBA interim title, and don't you just love that the WBA has 73,000 titles on offer. Uh, so after that fight, Ortiz tested positive for Nandrolone. He was subsequently um, found guilty and banned for nine months. But basically a year or so later, after he'd served his time, he came back and he again claimed the interim title. His most notable win, uh, you would say, is easily against Brian Jennings, who by all accounts is a pretty decent fighter. Uh, I certainly rate him. He went 12 rounds with Klitschko and uh, Ortiz um, knocked him out. And he really looked good in that fight. And as we know, Brian Jennings has not been cited in the ring since. Uh, more recently, he's beaten Tony Thompson, Malik Scott and David Allen. All of which he took care of. He didn't always look the best against a couple of those guys. But he took care of them. And I'll come back to this um, a little bit later on. But he got the job done and he kept the streak going. Currently, he's the mandatory challenger for the WBA. He's number three for the WBC, number 10 for the WBO, and he's not currently rated by the IBF. Interesting, but he's not. If we have a look at BoxRec.com, it ranks Luis Ortiz as the number six heavyweight in the world today. So you'd have to say, well, apart from the popping dirty for Ped's part and serving his uh, time, the nine month suspension, he's had a pretty decent career, right? So you have to ask the question then, into his eighth year as a pro, why can't he get a title shot? And I'm not talking about this interim title that he's held, because that's not a real title. 
you know what I mean. We're talking about one of the main belts. So why can't he get a title shot? Look at Anthony Joshua and Joseph Parker. They hold three of the four respective belts. They managed to get a title shot relatively early, early on in their careers. And even the other belt holder, Deontay Wilder, he'd been around the block quite a bit before he got a shot, but he still got his shot for the title and he took it home. So this is what I want to dive into. So let's break it down. Promotional issues. He's, uh, since 2010, he's obviously been through a number of promoters, most notably Golden Boy, Matchroom more recently, and now he's with Al Heyman. It would be actually quite easy to say that his promotional issues are a big part of why he um, hasn't had a title shot. It's certainly a part of the reason, but I don't believe it is the biggest part. I think the situation with Luis Ortiz is one of these where it's a whole series of factors and they just happen to have combined at the right or wrong time, in his case it, it may be, uh, to sort of work against him. So in terms of Golden Boy, I actually think that they deserve some credit here because as I alluded to, he popped dirty for Peds and Andrew Lone back in 2014. In just over a year, and he served that nine month ban, but basically, almost a year later, he was able to fight again for that interim title that he'd previously held. So you've got to say, I think, you know, they've done it pretty well to get him back in that position. Obviously, he wasn't happy that he wasn't getting um, a shot. Eventually, he left Golden Boy and he signed more recently, about a year or so ago, for Matchroom. So that was much vaunted at the time and people were speculating, well, Luis King Kong Ortiz. He's finally going to get a shot now. It didn't turn out that way. As we later found out, he was on a fight by fight deal. And it just so happened to be he looked like shit in both of them. Against Malik Scott in Monaco, couldn't cut off the ring. And Malik Scott looked like he wanted to lay down all night. The ref, the ref basically had to haul him back off the canvas to keep him fighting. It, it wasn't a good look. And Ortiz then faced David Allen, and that was on an undercard, was it a Joshua fight? I can't remember, actually. He got the job done, but he didn't look like the sort of force you were expecting. People saying that this guy is the most av avoided heavyweight in the world. Well, I don't know why people were avoiding him if that was what he was bringing to the table. Anyway, we'll come back to the most avoided part a little bit later on. After the Dave Allen fight, he left Matchroom. It was a little bit surprising, but uh, then he signed for Al Heyman. He hasn't had a fight yet. He was scheduled to have a fight against Derek Rossi earlier this year, I believe in April. Hurt his hand, and he's been on the shelf since. He's got that WBA manager position locked down. So that is to fight Anthony Joshua. And he probably is not going to do anything in the, for the time being. But we'll have to see. He's going to have to take some sort of stay busy fight at some point. But in terms of the matchroom situation, a lot of speculation that he would be put in line for a title shot. I think there was a lot of optimism from fans. But as it transpired, nothing really happened. Eddie Hearn in interviews, and you've probably seen them as well, did talk about those couple of fights that he had and said, well, it's hard to market him because he didn't look that good. I mean, there is the sort of conspiracy side of the shot that would say, well, he wanted to keep him close and keep him away from Anthony Joshua. But as we know, those, um, you know, often promoters like to have the fights in house because all the money stays in house. It's a lot easier to, to make those matches. But um, yeah, Al Heyman, we'll have to see what he can do for him, but it's, it's certainly no better promoter to be with outside of Eddie Hearn. Another reason I think that he hasn't got the title shot that he richly deserves I think he might have chosen the wrong sanctioning body to uh, sort of throw his lot in with. So obviously he's gone the WBA route and he's actually entered the rankings way back in 2011, June 2011. Go look it up on the WBA site. I actually couldn't believe it was that long. So he was number 15 in that month. And as we know, basically since then, apart from the time where he did his uh, ban for PEDS, he's been reasonably high in the rankings and more recently, um, 
often in the top five, and right now he is the mandatory. So he's been near the top of the heap for a long time. As we know, though, the WBA is a bit of a mess. They've got 30,000 titles. So you've got the super champion, the regular champion, and the interim champion. So Luis Ortiz was the interim champion twice, actually, but people don't really regard that as a world title. It's generally well accepted that the super champion is the proper champion. Uh, the WBA, even at the start of last year, they tried to hold a tournament to get the three belts down to one. Fans didn't want all this confusing crap. Um, but that tournament basically fell apart before it began. Remember, it's boxing. Nothing is ever easy. Also, with this whole WBA situation, you've got all these guys in the rankings that are seemingly holding it up and muddying the waters. Look at Fred Quindo. He took court action against them. You've got appeals by Lucas Brown following testing dirty for Pent himself. And then somehow you've got Alexander Ustinov right in the mix there. So you have a number of champions and a number of other things going on. So you'd have to say that this, in my view, is getting in the way of him actually getting a proper title shot. Another reason he hasn't had a title shot, in my view, doesn't speak English. It does hurt him. I find it very hard to connect with him. You know, when you can't understand someone, it's difficult. Most fans, sure, they respect him and his ability. But how many hardcore Luis Ortiz fans outside of those who are either Cuban or Spanish speakers do you know? I have no idea what Luis Ortiz is like as a person beyond the ring. You often pick some of this sort of stuff and glean it from interviews and other sort of promotional sort of things. But with him, I have no clue. And something is definitely lost when a translator is used. And let's face it, and this is where I'm sort of saying that everything's sort of interconnected. It's not just one thing. This whole non-English speaking thing, it hurts promotions that he's involved in. People can't understand it, thus decreasing his value. It makes those fights so much harder to promote, especially to English speak uh, speaking fans, thereby capping his value. If he brings limited value to a fight, which becomes difficult to promote, I can see why he's running into so many roadblocks. Another key reason, and perhaps the most obvious reason he's struggling to get a decent fight, let alone a title shot, he's just a little bit too dangerous. We all know how boxing works. You start with you know, some bums at the beginning, you slowly build your way up, build your confidence, build your profile, gradually step it up, work your way through the levels, and these are often all one-sided fights, and eventually the competition level is lifted to the point where it's competitive fights. You're actually going into fights where people go, I don't know if you can win. I mean, how many of those fights that Luis Ortiz has had would you have said that it's at that level? He topped out at Bryant Jennings. Everyone saw that performance and thought, oh, no thanks. He's certainly been linked to a number of names and contenders. The list is so long, I'm not even going to bother reading it out. There have been so many people that have been linked to Luis Ortiz and potential fights. It's incredible. So needless to say, I understand his frustration. He's like a piece of aging fruit, slowly aging, not getting picked, but slowly withering away on the vine. Because you know what's going to happen now, right? When eventually he does get a decent fight, people are going to say, oh, well, he was too old. They waited until he was too old. The guy is already 38. I mean, that is not a huge handicap. But certainly if people are starting to lose a step, lose a bit of lateral movement and other bits and pieces, the older they get, you have to say he's not going to get any better. So his age is becoming a problem. And I don't want to see him forced to a position where he's 40 years old and fighting for that first title shot. It's not fair on him. 
He should have had one, what, two or three years ago, at least, at least. There was a situation earlier this year where he put himself forward to fight Deontay Wilder. As we know, Wilder's um, fight, I think it was Wurizic, he tested dirty for Peds. God, so many Peds in the sport. Anyway, Gerald Washington was eventually sort of uh, drafted into fight. But Ortiz had stepped forward on social media and said, I'll take that. I will fight you. That was only on a few weeks' notice. But because Ortiz himself had popped dirty for Peds, that gave Wilder the out he needed to say, thanks, but no thanks. And you can't blame Wilder for that. Ortiz has only got himself to blame. But it's just the added bit in this whole pie that makes it um, difficult for him to get fights. So let's leap forward to current day. Mandatory for the WBA belt, which Anthony Joshua currently holds. We know he's at the back of the queue. Firmly at the back of the queue. Vladimir Klitschko, if he takes the rematch, okay, so that's in October. We already know there's a deal in place that Kubrat Pulev, who's the IBF mandatory, is next. So Ortiz, he's at least looking this time, if not later, next year to get his shot. Jesus. I know people have come out and said that, you know, he's got the, and this is his people, that he's got the paperwork to prove he should be next. And they'll go to court and they'll make it that he has to give up the belt and that sort of stuff. I don't think that will happen. The WBA wouldn't allow it. I mean, Anthony Joshua is the money man at the moment. He is making it rain. There's Benjamins all over the place. But I think that this talk from Ortiz's camp is not so much designed to actually really lead its way to court. Because you could probably argue he's got a case and should have taken a case, you know, within the last couple of years to sort of say, well, his career has been hurt and he's not getting what he should be entitled to. I think it's more about that. He's out of people's gaze right now. He just wanted to remind them, hey, I'm still here. Don't forget about me. The real King Kong Ortiz, he's still here. I feel for the guy. But as they say, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Things will not change for Luis King Kong Ortiz. And boxing is the poorer for it. That's it from me. Hit like and subscribe. Really interested in your thoughts on this one. Drop a comment. I'm out.